um, so like you said, I'm Carl. Um, so I'm going to be talking um, about research that I'm doing for my uh, PhD. Um, so I'm talking about a model that I'm currently in the process of building. So I don't have any results to share. So instead, I'm going to talk you through how I got to be doing agent-based modeling and some concerns that went into it as I was doing it. So just to sort of get you situated, when I talk about Atlantic Europe or the Atlantic zone or the Atlantic facade, um, I'm talking about this sort of corridor of seaways running up from um, Portugal and Spain to the Shetland Islands. Um, and archaeologists have sort of acknowledged for a long time that there are similarities between uh, these coastal areas. Um, where they tended to differ, oh, this is my study area in the Western English Channel, um, where they tended to differ is in how they see the sea facilitating or inhibiting these connections. So people have characterized the sea as a barrier, so they've emphasized that um, seafaring carries the risk of catastrophic failure, so you sink, you die, um, that's bad. Um, they've noticed that Atlantic weather and tides, uh, they're different to that Mediterranean, and that's important because a lot of GIS modeling that's happened has happened in the Mediterranean. Um, they're a lot more changeable, you get tide ranges that are completely different, so there's a, a sort of a paradigm shift to take into account. Um, they pointed out that a lot of sites, particularly in parts of the Atlantic facade, like uh, Western Wales, um, there's a lack of material culture that can actually prove direct contact between specific sites. Um, and then they've also pointed out in places where we are sure there was connections, you do see during periods um, um, the sort of development of discontinuities that might suggest isolation. Uh, finally, also, when you're talking about these coastal sites, um, it's particularly promontory forts, which occur across the Atlantic facade. Um, a lot of them are unexcavated, um, and the interpretation of them is kind of open to debate. So the original interpretation of them were as defensive sites. Um, it's also been suggested that they were sort of symbolic enclosures to do with the sea, uh, rather than perhaps um, something more prosaic like a settlement or a stopping place for a ship. So the other way to understand the sea in terms of the Atlantic zone, a uh, sort of more recent package of theories, that sees the sea as a highway. So that sees the sort of waterways as connecting these different communities. Um, the fact that the site, there are shared site types that occur off and down that so this zone is sometimes taken as evidence that the sea was sort of easier to travel on than the land. Um, they point out that see that shipping things is a very efficient way of moving supplies, a very efficient way of moving people in volumes that you can't overland, especially you know when there are sort of climatic differences and the land might be a bit soggy or more difficult than it is today. Um, so what I'm interested in for my research uh, is this first sort of opposition between seafaring is something that carries big risks and seafaring is something that promises big rewards. And right now, I think both of these both of these sort of points are valid when you're talking about seafaring. Both these things are true. And to really start to critique these theories, uh, we need to sort of try and say, how risky is voyaging? Um, is that something we can approach? And so I'm approaching this question through the lens of an Asian-based model. I'm also interested um, in the sort of interpretation of these coastal sites. It's how I got into this kind of analysis. Um, so that's something I'm hoping um, I can also speak to by running the model I'm about to describe. So my research questions are, uh, one, how difficult is it to cross the Western English Channel in an Iron Age boat, um, particularly along different routes um, at different times of year? Because, I mean, you can say there's a sailing season, but the sort of brackets on that sailing season aren't particularly well defined, as far as the Iron Age is concerned, anyway. Um, and assuming different levels of sailing experience, right? So that's a major, you know, um, factor in the risk of the voyage is how well you know the waters and how well you can read the seas. Um, so I'm also interested in whether coastal sites are positioned such that they can actually be used as sea marks. Um, and I'm interested in comparing the results of this model that I'm producing uh, with the sort of thought experiments that are produced by archaeologists. And hopefully, once I run the model and thought about it really, really hard, um, I'll be able to sort of speak to this sort of conflict of narratives to do with the Atlantic Zone. So there's some related work. Um, Sean McGrail in the 80s um, called on his experience of seafaring, which is considerable. And he basically ran, he, he basically modeled these routes in his head. So it was a sort of a, a series of thought experiments that he did to work out what the possible routes across the English Channel would have been. Um, another later, um, Eileen Wilkes in her PhD dissertation um, 
did a lot of desk space assessment and some excavation to work out where the landing places um, for Iron Age mariners might have been along the southern coast of England and developed a criteria for um, those sort of coastal nodes, as she called them. Um, I'm also kind of drawing on work by uh, Richard Callahan and Chris Scar, um, who did a model of seafaring uh, in Britain during the Neolithic, um, but was interesting in that what the model was doing was getting sort of reading the seas and then supplying that information to the modeler who then decided what kind of sort of course to set and then that sort of iterated through. Um, so I think that I'm hopefully kind of kind of following in this development. I'm also drawing, I hate to plug myself, I'm also drawing on my own um, research that I did for my master's uh, where I did um, was it primarily uh, visibility modeling but I also um, created least cost surfaces and least cost paths around the coast of Pembrokeshire. Um, and while I was doing that, I was, I was vaguely aware of agent-based modeling. Um, as I was sort of finishing that analysis, I started really thinking about least cost path modeling versus agent-based modeling, especially how it relates to the sea. So I've sort of broken it down here in kind of general terms. Um, so sort of the advantages of least cost path modeling as I see them is that it's well established in archaeology. There are lots of least cost path papers out there you can look at. Um, the algorithms are implemented in GIS packages and they're implemented in several different ways, which is very nice. So you, there's some sort of back and forth there that you can draw on. Um, and then the inputs are usually, you know, raster data sets. So they're creatable with GIS tools. Um, they're sort of easier to mani manipulate. The disadvantages, as far as modeling on SEER are concerned, is that the um, least cost path tools in a GIS use static inputs. And that's not necessarily a problem when you're talking about terrestrial navigation, because you wouldn't expect topography to change while you're out walking. Um, but if you're doing an LCP for the sea surface, um, you are using properties of hydrography uh, as sort of proxies for slope aspect pro properties of topography that would inform an LCP. Um, so I think that if you're doing um, navigation of sea modeling at sort of the scale and resolution that I'm attempting, you need to be able to incorporate dynamic inputs, um, which would require sort of taking apart the LCP algorithm and putting it back together in a certain way. Um, and then related to that, um, because I'm interested in experience, um, one of, the pro one of the problems I saw in least cost paths is that they're designed to find the optimal route. Um, and there are ways you could work around that, but it would be by modifying, you know, your analysis. Um, and related to that as well, um, to create an LCP requires basically characterizing your parameters as costs. And it's possible, I think, to parameterize every, most things to do with navigation as costs. But I don't think it's, it's not necessarily straightforward to do so. And it's not necessarily efficient to do so. Um, just as an example, um, say I want visibility as a parameter in my model because if you can't see a landmark you don't know where you are suppose suppose um, i could create a cumulative view shed and have that as a component in my least cost path or uh, in my lcp algorithm but because the tide range in the channel is 10 meters i'd have to create a bunch of those so maybe i create one every 10 centimeters so that's more computing and i'm also introducing this 10 centimeter increment that i have to defend so it's not straightforward to parameterize everything as cost um, Agent-based modeling I was kind of attracted to because um, the fact that it's built on sort of a set of code, depending on what platform you're in, um, you can sort of tailor that process, tailor the code to your research question. And related to that, you can code it to use temporal or non-master inputs, um, and you can sort of iterate through time rather than space because it's not necessarily cell-based what you're doing. And the disadvantages are, you know, there are fewer archaeological examples to work from for published papers um, because you're not you're not sort of um, creating raster inputs for all of your sort of parameters you want to do you have to think a little bit harder about reconciling data that's at different scales and you might end up having to create your model from scratch which is what I ended up doing rather than taking apart the LCB algorithm and putting it back together so the analysis that I plan to do um, is to run my model so to simulate voyages between coastal nodes uh, in southern England and Brittany, I'm trying to identify the ones of Brittany, um, for um, the routes between coastal nodes, so all routes, um, for all days between March 1st and September 30th of this year. So I'm collecting the environmental data as we speak. Um, 
And then I'm hoping by running all those simulations over and over again under different sets of parameters, so assuming different levels of experience um, and assuming, I think, different weather conditions, um, whether those voyages are successful. And I'm hoping, so this is just a graphic I stole from some computer science website, um, I'm hoping <laughs> that what I'll end up is something that looks kind of like that, or that, in other words, there will be a certain level of experience um, at which crossing the channel becomes easy or hard, or maybe it's just always hard, or maybe it's easy within a certain window of time. Uh, these are all results I, I think I could get, and I'm looking forward to working through. Just moving on to my data sources. Um, so most of my environmental data comes from the French um, hydrographic and oceanographic uh, naval service. Um, so I have uh, hourly current velocity and direction, wind speed and direction, tide height, uh, wave and swell direction, uh, wave and swell speed, and wave and swell period data um, for the English Channel. Um, I'm also getting other data, data sources, so I've actually been logging the shipping forecast um, because it has visibility forecasts, um, so it's an input into my model. Um, I have um, terrain data sets, so I'm using the NASA GPL's um, one arc second SRTM data set. And then for the archaeological sources, uh, I have convenient um, resources like the um, uh, Hillforts Atlas, um, some sort of government, um, sort of cultural, sort of antiquity data sets, and then I'm digitizing um, gazetteers and more traditional resources like that. In terms of talking about the boat and how the boat interacts with the environment, um, I'm sort of taking a high level view of this, these by trying to create a polar diagram for a possible Iron Age ship. So the polar diagrams are used to sort of, um, they were, they've been developed to sort of optimize the performance of sailing vessels. Uh, people who rail sailboats use them um, to sort of log how fast a ship will go um, depending on its angle relative to the oncoming wind. So you can see, this is just sort of a schematic. So the angle on the graph represents the angle that the boat is heading and then sort of its distance along this axis length of knots is how fast it's moving at that time. So just as a point of reference, here's a modern sailboat, semi-modern sailboat. Um, so you can see that when it's running with the wind, it's going to be fast. When it's on a reach, it's going fastest. And then your speed starts to slow down as you start to go into the wind until you reach the dead zone where you're not moving at all. Now, archaeologists have developed polar diagrams for reconstructed ships. Um, so just a couple examples here is a, a Viking ship. Um, the Rorage, uh, which was reconstructed by the University at Roskilde, and then for the Mediterranean, uh, the Kyrenia ship, which actually got going quite fast. It's a much larger ship. Um, so the relationship between sort of wind speed, um, angle of attack can be quantified, I think. And I'm hoping to use stuff like McGrail, or resources like McGrail, to work out what uh, sort of a plausible polar diagram for an Iron Age ship. So in McGrail's sort of thought experiments, he talks about what the capabilities of a ship might have been. Um, so in particular, he says that a um, Iron Age ship probably couldn't have sailed close to the wind in seven points. Um, when you start doing nautical stuff, you have to learn a completely new set of terminology, but trust me, it's eight degrees. Um, and he talks about sort of, based on the classical sources, so the reports of voyages, uh, in Roman times, sort of how fast they would have been able, what their maximum speed would have been, uh, what the minimum speed would have been, what their average speed would have been. So what's underneath my, bottle, my model, as far as sort of quantifying ship performance is concerned, is a set of curves representing how fast the ship would have gone, given an angle attack, thank you, and um, the speed of the wind. How does the model work? Um, basically, at each time step, I query these environmental data sets that I've mentioned, calculate the wind and current direction and velocity. I adjust those by a factor uh, related to the experience. Uh, so, I'm, so in this case, it's specifically the, how well you can read those conditions. Um, I'm searching for landmarks. Um, so um, determine whether at that location, the person navigating the ship can see land. So there's an example of a navigation system used in the 20th century actually in Shetland, where they are basically navigating based on alignments between uh, points on land and points on the coast. Um, so if it, I'll perform that visibility analysis, and if it comes up with nothing, uh, then it's good, then the script will basically estimate uh, the position. If it comes up with something, then it, the position will be uh, communicated exactly to the next step, uh, which is to predict for each one degree heading where the ship is likely to be in an hour. So it worked. <laughs> 
Um, so basically, it's, it's kind of a brute force method, but I'm just calculating all the headings based on uh, that polar diagram. And then I am selecting a heading based on its proximity to the destination point. Uh, then I go back to those original values, uh, and I do the same, perform the same calculation, and the heading, based on the heading that's selected, to work out where the ship will actually go. And I basically just repeat that process. Um, so again, I'm still designing it. Um, this is the latest thing that I had. Um, so the visibility stuff isn't implemented yet, but you can see that the gray line is chart assessment. So the script is using the actual current and uh, wind values. Um, the yellow line, it's underestimating them slightly. The orange line, it's underestimating them a lot. And you can see how that impacts the course. You can see basically the script attempting to correct itself, which I think is pretty cool. Um, just briefly, some sort of challenges, um, concerns, opportunities that I've thought about while developing this. Um, the first thing is that sort of the data sets that meteorolo meteorologists and hydro hydrographers use, um, they can be kind of difficult to access and to work with, um, especially if you're sort of working in a raster-based environment. These are file formats that you know do have hourly readings, which is really powerful. It's just a matter of sort of getting into them. Um, um, experience, as I've defined it, is defined pretty narrowly. It's just um, the ability to read the Cs. Um, in particular, something that's occurred to me is that basically the model as I've designed it tries to be tries to work one step ahead in that you are at a location, the agent is at a location, tries to predict a heading, follows that heading, and then repeats the process. I think it would be interesting to have a simulation in which the model tries to be multiple steps ahead. So it will simulate something and then try to learn from that. But it's, I think, programmatically beyond, uh, beyond my capabilities at the moment. And then, of course, I'm focusing on the Western English Channel. But I think um, it would be very interesting to try and run a similar simulation for more of the Atlantic zone. Um, in that, I'm mainly limited by the data sets that I've got. So my main data set is from the French Naval Office. You know, they only have data for France. Uh, the English data is behind a paywall that I can't get through. So um, it would be useful to try and run that sort of simulation. I see no barriers to it computationally. Um, but it's something I'm interested in. So I think I'm about done. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you guys for listening. And uh, don't forget to vote in the Nick Ryan Thank you.